It has been said that the Gospel of Luke is based around meals. That Jesus is either coming from a meal, he's at a meal, or on his way to the next meal. His first miracle happens at a wedding feast. Possibly his most famous meal is the Last Supper. And we have a picture in Revelation of a great feast that is to come one day. Meals were and still are important to Jesus. That's why we focus on the E of eat in the blessed rhythms. As we have trained missionaries to live more incarnationally like Jesus, we have found time and again that one of the places where the greatest breakthrough in spiritual conversation happens mm -hmm. is around the table. I often joke that if you share a plate of ribs with someone, you usually break into a new level of vulnerability and friendship afterward. When it comes to breathing in meals as followers of Jesus, we should pattern our life after His and break away from time to time with other disciples of Jesus to share a meal where we debrief, we pause the action, we enjoy an unhurried time to celebrate, mourn, and also prepare for mission. And when it comes to breathing out meals as followers of Jesus, we should pattern our life after His and find ways to open our doors and our tables to make room for people to taste the belonging within the kingdom of God and the family of God. And sometimes Jesus does this with large crowds by feeding them. Sometimes he takes over parties like he did with Matthew and his notorious sinner friends. Or sometimes he did it with people like Zacchaeus. Yeah, and we can contextualize these various sized gatherings in our lives. Sometimes we might throw large parties and gather with dozens of people. Sometimes we may share a meal with a handful of people. And there are times when the conversation requires a more intimate space of one to three. One thing is for certain, the more meals we share, the more we become like family with those we're discipling, the more opportunity we have to share physical bread and spiritual bread. In the following video, Hugh Halter will share how he discovered the importance of sharing meals and some practical resources you can pick up to understand how to engage the spiritual practice of happy hour and sharing meals. Well, hi there, this is uh, Hugh Halter, and I am excited to talk with you a little bit about a line of resources that we've created to help you and your friends and your family just live as missionaries right where you are. Um, as you've noticed, the world has changed quite a bit in the last 10 years, and one of the big changes really that started happening 40 years ago is that people ain't coming no more. And by ain't coming, I mean they're, they're just not uh, going to be coming to the churches that you and I enjoy and attend, maybe on Sunday. And so it's, uh, it's probably high time, maybe uh, we're even late to the game, but it for sure is time to learn how to live as a missionary right now, uh, right where we're at, just like we would if we were to go anywhere else in the world. And so we began to create some resources to help you uh, to just simply live as a missionary and uh, call it the Life as Mission series because we actually believe the church is people. And so your life uh, is literally the mission of God and it's the front door to how people find faith. Um, and it's really about how they find you. And so uh, you've got to get out there now. And uh, one of the things that uh, we started to realize was that there was a missionary skill that has not been developed in the church for a long time. And it's the missionary skill that can work anywhere in the world. Uh, no matter where you're at, um, this one particular skill seems to be like the secret sauce. And that is simply that you learn how to eat and talk with your friends. Um, it's been there since the beginning of time. It's how cultures uh, create uh, bonds with other cultures and cross-culture. That's why missions oftentimes we call it a cross-cultural uh, experience and that's really what we're doing today when we're trying to get the the faith that we have in Jesus over to our friends we're literally crossing over those cultures and uh, music oftentimes is a way to connect but uh, food is the other one really those two things it's like it doesn't matter anywhere you go in the world if you can enjoy some food together and you can talk maybe something will begin to move and begin to happen and so the life is mission series is really all about that social connection. Sometimes we, we say that unless you create social connection, you're never gonna see the spiritual connection happen. And so um, the skill of just learning how to be great with people is, is really the, the first thing that we have to begin to think about if we're gonna engage the world with the message of God again. And so uh, we've done this with literally hundreds of churches, uh, many, uh, all of which called us because they wanted to, to move more missionally, as they said. And then uh, during the training, 
we would ask them to do certain things like throw a party for friends. And we just found that people were really awkward and said it was terrible or that they didn't trust their uh, Christian friends with their non-Christian friends. They didn't know what to do with alcohol or weed or all sorts of other things that are, are now legal and a part of normal life. And so uh, the Happy Hour book was really the very first one that I wrote because uh, when we were thinking about all of the adults that had come to faith, most of them came to faith in our, in our life, in our home. Um, our son Ryan had really severe uh, physical disability and so we were not able to leave our home like a lot of folks. And so we just had, had to learn how to open up the front door and make the most of what we had, kind of play the hand we were dealt. And, uh, and so inviting people over became literally the very first thing. So uh, the invitation was not to the church, the invitation was to our home and generally to some type of a meal, either a happy hour or a dinner or a weekend party, Bronco football game, whatever it might be. And uh, we, when we like thought about literally hundreds of our friends that came to faith, we were looking at each one of them. We said, well, what, what happened? What did we do that uh, maybe helped the process? And every single one of those we invited over for a meal and a meal with friends. And uh, when we were baptizing them, a lot of times we'd ask them, you know, tell us about your story. Tell us how this happened. They said, well, the Halters invited us over or the Brawns invited us over or the Johnsons invited us over. It was just a common theme. And so we just started to go, this is the secret sauce of mission is learning how to uh, open up our front door. Now, it's not just a weird thing that we're trying today. This was actually there at the beginning of the church. Um, if you read the book of Acts, the church is just beginning to form. And there's a story in Acts 10 that was like the one story that like, I don't know why we don't think it's that big of a deal, but it's when the church uh, ceased being a racist movement and became a movement for the whole world. And by racist, I mean, it was only open to the Jewish people. That's how people viewed the gospel. And uh, all of a sudden, you remember uh, one of the church leaders, Peter, was up on a roof and he's having a little devotion time, uh, praying as all religious people do. And uh, while he's up there, he falls into a dream, a little trance, if you will. And all of a sudden there's a big uh, white tablecloth that comes down and God begins to put all these animals on the tablecloth in his mind. All, all the animals that Peter knew growing up as a good religious boy, you, don't, you just don't ever touch these things. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the word of God came to Peter and said, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter went, no way, man. That's not how I grew up. It's not like we don't touch these things. We don't hang out with those types of people. And uh, very interesting, back in those days, somebody judged their spirituality almost primarily by who they ate with and who they didn't eat with and what they ate and what they didn't eat. It was very much related to that. Like it has become in, in many of our experiences. When we grew up in church, we only hung out with church people. We only let our kids spend the night at the homes where we knew the families were already a part of our church. And so we see the same tendency we always have to kind of create our own little religious bubbles with our own little religious rules. And that's what Jesus knew he had to begin to change. And so he gives Peter this dream that all this stuff that you thought was a no-go is now it's like open game. <laughs> like you can enjoy this stuff now and you're going to need to. And, and he actually says, no, the word has to come to him three times because he just doesn't get it. He's that slow. And I would say, folks, the church is probably pretty slow on this whole party thing. Um, Cause I bring it up all the time and people fight against it. And they're like, well, no, I thought that was wrong. And we're not going to have any of that stuff in my house. And, uh, all sorts of things that they sound right at first, but when you really think about the way of Jesus, you go, oh, maybe, maybe that's not what he was doing. And of course he's not. That's why he has to tell Peter, um, we're going to, we're going to change the rules, so to speak now. And, uh, so as the story goes on, you can read it for yourself in Acts 10. Uh, some of the Roman boys, there's a centurion who's a God fearing man. And it's kind of a cool part of the story is that the people that are in our lives, they're not anti-God. Uh, a lot of them love God or love the idea of, of God and hope that he's alive and well in the world. The world's hard enough right now, so almost anybody's hoping that God is still around. And so this Roman centurion um, who, uh, who loves the poor and gives to the poor and loves God, uh, God begins to move in his life. And... 
uh, he sends two men up to find Peter. So you got, basically, you got the enemy. Remember, the Romans were the enemies of, of Peter. Sorry, I'm going to have a little drink right now. Peter's a young Jewish boy, and uh, Romans are occupying them. And so this, is, this would be like uh, how we feel maybe about Al-Qaeda or something. And all of a sudden, God sends a couple Al-Qaeda boys up to talk to a Texan. And uh, it says that these men, they uh, got up to where Peter was staying. He was out on the coast with a, with a friend that was a tanner. Um, and I've been up to this part of the, the world. It's very beautiful. And so these guys come up, these Romans, and they st- it says they stood outside the, the gate. They didn't enter, like they didn't come through the front gate and then go knock on the door because that was very disrespectful. Uh, they knew that the Jewish people hated them. So uh, even these guys were like, well, let's not go too close. And then the angel has to tell Peter, hey, bro, quit overthinking the dream. I need you to go downstairs and open the door and, and greet these guys. So Peter goes down and uh, the scripture says that Peter invited them in. Now, when you just read that, you just would keep reading. But the fact that he invited, that was the very first time ever that somebody in the church, the formation of the church, let somebody that was an enemy into their house. And all of a sudden they have this amazing conversation. Now, of course, uh, we don't know this, but they would have known this. When you invite somebody in, you always offer food and drink and uh, shelter and protection and whatever else. That's just part of Middle East hospitality. And so um, when this guy invites or when Peter invites these guys in, they clearly have a good time because uh, a couple days later, these two guys, they say, hey, Peter, can you come up and meet uh, with our Roman centurion friend? Like he wants you to have uh, just come up and, and meet his friends and talk. So I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, The Big Fat Greek Wedding, but it's kind of like that scene. It's like people have never <laughs> hung out together. They don't understand each other's customs and they don't like each other. All of a sudden, Peter goes up and he enters. It says he enters the house of this uh, this big Roman centurion, like a general. And the Roman man drops to his knees and falls on his face before Peter. Uh, somehow he knew that Peter represented something that uh, not only he believed in, that he was trying to find. And Peter said in that moment, he said, Sir, please stand up. I'm just a man too. So all of a sudden, something happens in the houses where we don't view people as insiders or outsiders or uh, people that we're trying to reach or not. They're just, they're our neighbor Bill or our neighbor Karen. And we realize we're just like them in, in almost every single way, except that we believe something different than them. And uh, so after Peter says to this man, hey, sir, stand up. Peter began to then expose, kind of confess, hey, I kind of grew up pretty religious and I thought you guys were the enemy and blah, blah, blah. You can just uh, read it yourself. And he says, now God has shown me that I should not call anything impure unclean anymore. And essentially I shouldn't call you guys un- unpure, unclean anymore. Like I see it all differently now. And then it said that he, Peter's got to share the entire gospel with uh, a lot of people. And that was just kind of the cool story. From that moment on, like the church begins to open up. Now it took, it took a lot of the Jewish people time to figure this out and learn the nuances and okay, what do we do about this stuff? And what do we do about, it? they don't they don't like the stuff that we serve here and should see the stuff that they're bringing to the table. And so there's probably a ton of questions, just like you and I have a ton of questions. Um, but I find that uh, the answer is a lot easier than we think. And uh, so happy hour, really, it's the, uh, the subtitles, the art and etiquette of holy merriment. And what we're trying to provide is like, if you ever see it, it's the smallest little book you could have ever had, because we don't got to talk a lot about how to throw a party, but we got to talk a little bit, just enough to get you going. And uh, so hopefully you'll grab that with a couple of your friends and read it and just start making the sharing of meals a natural rhythm of your life. And I think you'll find something pretty powerful happens almost every time you have somebody over for dinner and you just ask, how's your week going? Uh, instead of praying before the meal, you just, you'll learn how to, how to just say a toast and you go, hey, to Joe and Susie, man, we're just glad you're here and we wanna raise a glass to you. And we know it was a rough week last week, but we just, we just uh, wanna say a blessing that uh, this next week would be a better week for you guys and your family. 
And you will find uh, when you stop doing the religious stuff and just start doing the normal stuff, uh, a social connection will happen. We oftentimes say the way to the soul is through the heart and the way to the heart is through the stomach. And uh, so maybe give it a shot. As uh, the great theologian Alan Jackson and Jimmy Buffett said, it's five o'clock somewhere. And so it might as well start uh, at your house maybe tomorrow night. So good luck. You can find these resources at hughhalter.com or 100 Movements Publishing or Amazon uh, or probably laying around an old used bookstore somewhere. But uh, I think you'll enjoy it and uh, might actually really change things. So good luck. Whenever I've been in a room where Hugh is training leaders, one of the questions he will inevitably ask is, how many meals can you begin to tithe? Now think about that for a moment. If we were to eat three meals a day for seven days, that's 21 meals a week. If we were to go by the standard of 10% in our tithing of finances and carry that over to our meals, could you begin to share two meals a week with others? Maybe that's one with other followers of Jesus and one with those who might be looking for that space of belonging. What if you stretched yourself to three or four? What do you think would begin to change as you share more meals with those in your primary context? As Hugh mentioned, we hope you'll head to hughhalter.com and pick up happy hour and consider how you can use eating to follow Jesus by throwing parties and sharing meals.